What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. And this isn't just another episode. I, I honestly can't even believe it's happening, mostly because of the guest that we have on today. He is a guy. He is named Dan Carlin. He is the host of a podcast called Common Sense, as well as a host of a podcast called Hardcore History. He's definitely a left of center guest for this particular show, just because obviously we, you know, tend to speak to people in, uh, you know, bands and that sort of stuff. So anytime I'm able to pull someone in that has a connection to independent music that falls out of this scene, I get so excited to bring it to you because the feedback I get, like, you know, for example, whatever, a couple episodes ago, we interviewed Roman Mars and he's a host of another podcast called 99% Invisible. The amount of feedback I got on that show show was amazing because you had people such as you know maybe yourself who's a regular listener of the show and is like hey i got exposed to this awesome thing and i i never even knew this existed i love to get that feedback and then there's also people that poke in and go oh hey i i'm a fan of of roman mars already i didn't even know your podcast existed it's incredible it's a two-way street i love to have that and so anyways more on dan carlin in a minute let's get into some other stuff propertyzac.com obviously for those of you who who use the internet which is all of you because you, that's what you're doing with this podcast right now so visit them they got all the latest and greatest on music news so i i dove into this article recently um there is the technology magazine called wired one of the co-founders of it is this guy named kevin kelly and uh i've heard of his name before but hadn't really explored much of his work tripped onto his website uh via an interview i heard of his on another podcast he mentioned just it was kind of a throwaway thing but he's like oh yeah i wrote this article called you know a thousand true fan and uh went to his website and kind of looked into it and uh you know this the idea that is contained within his uh, posting it isn't revolutionary because a lot of people have spoken about the sort of long tail effect where it's like, okay, you don't need to appeal to everybody in order to be successful. It's like, you know, the, the concept of making sure that the people that are into you will, you know, go anywhere, buy anything, do anything for you to keep you doing what you're doing, whether it's a band, whether it's, you know, a stand up comedian, whatever creative art that you are, are involved in. And so I've always known myself because it's a concept that I, I've, you know, I'm trying to stick true to because what we've developed here is awesome. Like, you know, I mean, straight up, we get anywhere between 10 to 20,000 downloads per episode of this show. It's, it's awesome because I get a lot of cool interactions from people uh, such as yourself, who's listening right now, who either suggest guests or contribute to the show, toss a review on iTunes. It is so enjoyable for me to do this that I would love if you, the listener, were to turn this into my job because, you know, I, I work a day job. I do other things that actually I, I do many other things in order to facilitate me having the lifestyle to be able to speak to these people and kind of get entry points into who they are and why independent music and DIY culture is important to them. So I, I'm just encouraging you, if you find any value in this show, contribute. Go to the right side of the website, 100wordspodcast.com, and toss a dollar, toss two dollars. I don't care. But the more of you that do that, if it's just a fraction of you that contribute a dollar or two dollars, this will start to grow. And I may be able to be put in a position where it's like, dude, you're going to be getting two shows a week. You're going to be getting a lot more cool stuff from me. So anyways, that was just a sort of rallying cry. I wanted to kind of put that in your head, share to you kind of a behind the scenes, like where my head is at. I would love to do this as a full-time endeavor. And the sort of feedback that I have gotten from you people kind of it leads me to believe that you would love more stuff from that perspective. So anyways, just wanted to put that out there. And uh, if you also are feeling so inclined, you can go to the website, 100wordspodcast.com, and there's an email newsletter. I send it out once a week. It basically just kind of recaps the the shows, the sort of behind the scenes stuff. I recommend cool things. Um, it, it, now we have, I don't know, like close to 100 people signed up to that thing. So it's awesome. It, it's, it tends to grow. So spread the word about that and sign up. And I have to mention a few people who have donated and left some reviews on iTunes. A person from Great Britain, who I'm not even going to attempt to read the username, said that I thoroughly enjoy discovering new people, bands, and artists that I wasn't familiar with before. That's awesome. And then a person named Jack Chapman dove into the iTunes and left a five-star review. Thank you very much. Said, that he really, really recommends this show to everybody. And so it's great because people that go to the iTunes page look at these reviews and are like, oh, okay, this is legit. I can trust this. So thank you very much. 
Enough of the plugging. So Dan Carlin, I honestly was astonished that I was able to get this interview. The dude is super busy. The Hardcore History Podcast, just to put it in perspective, it's you know continually one of the top podcasts in iTunes. It is so well respected amongst its fans, uh, the academic community, because basically what he does, he does like a four-hour show on a particular uh, either event, a world war, a uh, luminary within that historical context. It's amazing. And the sort of in-depth work that he does in regards to reporting on that specific time is unbelievable. Even if you have a passing interest in history, you will love what he does. And it's just, granted, it is intimidating because you're like, dude, four, four and a half hours, like that's a lot of time. I've listened to almost every single one and it is absolutely incredible. He is worth all of your time investing into it. So anyways, needless to say, I kind of heard him uh, do an interview and he alluded to the fact that, you know, he was raised kind of in the punk rock scene of the early 80s. And I was like, really? Like, this isn't just your your sort of typical dude who kind of like, you know, is a is a bookworm and likes to talk about history. This guy has a uh, has a rich past within the the, the punk and and independent music that we obviously all love so much. So I, I just sent a cold email. I was like, hey, would you be interested in this? And uh, his assistant got back to me and is like, yeah, this is something that he would be really interested in talking about because no one speaks to him about this. I was so stoked. So straight up, this was the most nervous I've ever been to do an interview. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I knew that he was going to be nice and accommodating because obviously he agreed to it. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know where this conversation would head and if he would have if he would feel comfortable revealing certain things about himself that he just doesn't talk about. So he was so awesome. And I felt, uh, yeah, I felt a kinship after we had spoke and it was cool because he was like, I can only do about 30 minutes. We were on the phone for about almost an hour and I could tell that he was completely enjoying himself. So that in and of itself is a compliment to the conversation that we were having. So anyways, without further ado, here is my conversation with Dan and I will talk to you. introduction to you and what you were doing as usual with most good podcasts they kind of you know start to bubble up to the surface and you know friends recommend other shows to friends and so a friend of mine who had already been listening to hardcore history was like ray i think you'd really enjoy this show basically it is history but in context and it was just like that little snippet of like oh yeah like i that that is meaningful to me because obviously in the age of the internet everything is devoid of context so i presume the uh, inception of both, you know, common sense and obviously hardcore history is that you wanted to paint a uh, more comprehensive picture, or was that even just kind of an afterthought or a byproduct of of your original purpose? Byproduct, because I thought we were going to be talking to history nuts and people who already understood the context, so I hadn't planned to involve a whole lot. As a matter of fact, when we started, I had just thought we would talk about the weirdness of any given story, assuming that the audience knew about the story. So like in the first one, I think we talked about Alexander the Great and Adolf Hitler, and we used it to kind of question, you know, views of good and evil over time and whatnot. And we didn't really tell you much about either one of those individuals. <laughs> we assumed you were going to know, right. you know. Um, and it was only over time that I realized that people were listening who liked what we were saying but needed the context for it to all kind of come together. So we evolved to that. I can't claim that that was ever a part of the plan. Yeah. Well, no, that's good because as in any good piece of quote-unquote art, uh, you know, the original context in which it's, uh, you know, created usually ends up not being what it is when it's finished. <laughs> so the, you know, the, the main reason that I wanted to have you on is because obviously people, you know, know you from the the podcasting realm and the sort of, you know, his, historian realm. But what kind of really made my ears perk up in regards to a selfish purpose and having you on my show was, uh, so you were doing the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I really enjoyed that episode. And towards the end of the show, it was kind of a, I wouldn't even say a throwaway comment, but you were just mentioning the fact that, uh, you know, I think he asked what music you were listening to and you're just like, oh, I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of stuck in my old ways and, you know, I'm an old punk rock guy and like love Dead Kennedys. And I was like, holy shit, that's incredible. Because like we were saying before we were recording, you know, that sort of music and that scene fosters such a, uh, 
you know, an independent train of thought. And so, uh, yeah, where did music kind of first enter your life to begin with? You know, good question. Um, I think the first time, you know, uh, when kids grow up, you go from kid music to adult music at some point. And I remember I was a kid and we were in the library and back then the library would lend out record albums. And so, you know, as a kid, I didn't have to buy one. And I think I was probably uh, eight or nine and it was Beatles albums. They had Beatles albums at the library. Mm -hmm. And so I think I transitioned from kid music to adult music with Beatles albums and um and and it kind of went from there but but music didn't really speak to me until the late 70s i mean i, I remember i had my first uh real sort of grown up kind of party as a kid a birthday party in middle school and this would have been in like oh, i don't know 78 or something and everybody was given record albums to to me and it was like foreigner and <laughs> it was all and and peter frampton and i just remember having no connection to that music whatsoever uh-huh. I mean, there, for me, there, I mean, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, that's a different thing. But but the kind of music that the 70s were producing when I was like 12, just a kiss. It just didn't do anything for me. When I first heard what we call, we didn't even have a name for it when I first heard it. A new wave, we started calling some of it. It was the first time I heard music and kind of went, wow, you know, I kind of really like that. I relate to that. And and so it was very different for me. Try as I might, I couldn't get into Foreigner. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And so where where were you at the time, like location wise? Uh, I'm from Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles, uh, so the Valley, San Fernando Valley. Sure, not, uh, probably Woodland Hills or something like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Because yeah, no, I mean, you bring up a very important point. It's like that that music was not uh, quote unquote defined as of yet. So it was just this sort of outlier of like, okay, you have your stuff that's on the radio or that's considered pop music, and then you have your weird stuff that you kind of put in the corner. Well, you know what? I didn't know. And, and and it took years for me to figure this out was when we were first exposed to uh, interesting, different music. I don't know what you want to. I've never been comfortable with the, the, the titles we use. They sound like radio program director type uh, uh, classifications for music. Right. But I, but but I didn't realize until later that most of the country never got exposed to that stuff. Uh, my wife is from Oregon and, and they didn't know this music existed even even 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you had to have back in the day some weird out of the way radio station that would play this stuff, you know, to expose you. And and in New York, they had it. And in LA, they had it. And in in some other big cities, they had it. I didn't realize the rest of the country didn't have it until years after the fact. But we had a station in Los Angeles um, and and they're famous now. At the time, they were this little nothing station called KROQ. Sure. And yeah, they're they're a whole genre now. But back then, they played music that most people didn't even want to listen to. And if you listened to that station and you met someone else who listened to that station, that was a bonding thing right there. I mean, that puts you in some weird, unusual group of people. I mean, people would sneer at you if you said you listened to that kind of station because why aren't you listening to Foreigner, man? <laughs> yeah, sure. Where, where's your where's your latest Fog Hat single, right? <laughs> I got three copies of the Foreigner Double Vision album at that <laughs> birthday party. Three So that tells you how things were. It was, for me, like a musical wasteland. Right, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I mean, people definitely uh, view K-Rock, like you said, as an institution, but it's like, you know, Rodney on the Rock, and he was doing such cutting-edge stuff in the early 80s of exposing people to, like, hey, this is the stuff that you'll hear from either Britain or that's happening right here in L.A. that you won't hear anywhere else. Rodney is someone you can't explain to people outside yeah. of LA either. Uh, we used to go out at night and we would run into him and his little entourage of, of almost surely underage girls and all these other things. <laughs> right. we, used to, we used to run into, because to us, he was an old guy um, when we would see him. He was always, he had this like 60s look with this shag haircut and he was 20 years older than we were. But for those who don't know, he was this strange guy who who got a time slot at this strange station and used to play all this music that no one had ever heard. And I mean, there are great bands that people know today who would be driving around L.A., call this guy and say, uh, we don't have an album, but we made this tape at my house. Will you play it? And he'd say, sure, come on down, bring it to me. I mean, this is kind of classic in DJ history. There are DJs like this. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it just shows you how different radio was back then that some guy could say, yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about, but but bring me the album and I'll play it or bring me the tape and I'll play it. And there were a lot of bands that that people first heard because that guy. I put him on the radio. Yeah, like you said, it's completely, you know, uncharted waters at that time. Were you in high school when sort of, you know, punk new wave started to infiltrate you and, and you know, kind of become more interesting to you? 
the first time I ever heard it, um, it, I mean, you know, again, we'd have to classify what it is, <laughs> sure. wouldn't we? Because I think the Velvet Underground's punk. I, I think if you listen, and this is a very American thing to say, they don't agree with this in, in places like Britain, but you listen to the Rolling Stones in 1969 to 1971 live, and that sounds punk to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first time I ever heard something where, I mean, it just knocked my socks off and I said, wow, I can't believe that. I was in Scotland in 1977 and they played Liar by the Sex Pistols. And if you remember the song, it swear, they swear straight yeah. up in that song. And we were listening to the radio, and I was with my family. And all of a sudden, you know, John Lydon starts saying the F word over and over and over again. And I, we all looked at each other. We were totally unprepared for that. Right. And, and, and to me, it's so funny to listen to the, to the Sex Pistols now and hear how nondescript it sounds and and try to remember how it burned your ears right. when you heard it in the in the late 70s i mean there were people who said oh my god that is so hard i can't listen to it and you listen to it now and i mean it's not quite muzak but it it doesn't <laughs> sound anything like it did at the time so the first time i ever heard it was 77 and i was too young for it to make any impression on me except oh my god can you believe they're swearing on the radio right right yeah the uh, through time stuff like that becomes you know obviously less edgy and sort of whitewashed and you know yeah and by 79 i was I, we were starting you know the the way you traditionally got into this stuff was you got into the lighter stuff first if you were young right mm-hmm. so about 79 i'm about 13 and you start – there's Blondie. There's all these – a lot of the New York bands especially, Power Pop. Uh, they used to call them New Wave. They, you know, they had all these little subgenres. All you knew though if you lived at that time period was you walk in a record store and over in the corner in this tiny little section would be all this weird stuff together. And it would always be in some little dark corner and there never was a lot of it. And it was always the strangest mix-up of stuff. I mean stuff today you go – that was with that. I mean, you'd have like the B-52s with Elvis Costello, with Tom Petty, with the Pretenders. And you would go, none of this stuff goes, Devo. You go, none of this stuff goes together. Right. And 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 yet that was the catch-all. Punk New Wave was the catch-all term for everything that didn't fit into standard radio programming. And, and t- to this day, I listened to things I wouldn't have listened to because it was in the same pile – with other stuff that I liked. And and a lot of it would not be called punk today. But to me, again, that's a, that's a very limiting term. You said hardcore when we first started talking. Mm-hmm. I mean, even hardcore is a subgenre of the, of the big picture, right? right? Yeah, no, you know, I always tend to use the words like, you know, whatever, independent music, just because that, you know, that at least frames it in the context of like, okay, you're not exactly going to hear this on the radio. But at the same time, uh, you know, no matter what moniker you put on it, it does you know, put it in a corner no matter what you do. We used to have to go get a lot of this stuff on import too. I mean, I, I remember going and paying absurd prices for singles from Europe because it was the only place you could get this stuff. And, and even sometimes American bands you'd have to get from the import label. Right. Um, but I remember buying a lot of this stuff. You know, you go to Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard, which is it was an enormous record store, like a warehouse. And they would have this tiny little section over in the corner where they threw all this stuff. And you'd go through it, and you would even heard of a lot of the bands. You'd go, "Oh my God, what is this?" And you know, you'd sometimes if it wasn't too expensive, you'd pick it up just to hear it. You know, um, I used to walk around. I, you know how much money I would give for my old T-shirt collection? I was thinking just the other day. I mean, <laughs> some of that stuff was so classic. And and about seventy nine is when I got into that stuff. And then about eighty one, when you get a little older and a little bit more edge, you're into even you know harder stuff. So I'd say about 81 is when is when it all came together for me. And I was I was really I mean, the Dead Kennedys are a perfect example. That's like 1980 for me. Yeah. Um, and and I, I still have that album somewhere in storage. And it is so scratched <laughs> that when I finally went online and downloaded some of those songs um, from iTunes, I, I didn't recognize them without certain parts being skipped over. <laughs> I hadn't heard the lyrics for years sure. on some of those parts. of it. So it's, I, I almost in thought the scratches were part of the song right right like that was intentional that's so funny yeah i would forgotten what it sounded like without it yeah no for sure yeah i i just have this uh like especially like i was referring to on the tim ferris podcast like when you mentioned when you mentioned dead kennedys i get this funny vision of you totally you know nose deep in a book listening to you know holiday in cambodia and i'm just like that's like that's like the perfect picture it's so hilarious but nobody you know that's something no one knows too these stereotypes drive me crazy because the people that I used to hang out with, most of whom were more hardcore than I was, mm-hmm. um, these were all really intelligent people. 
These were well-read people. I, I, I wouldn't have been hanging out with them otherwise. I mean, I wanted to have deep discussions with interest. And, and these and these guys and and women and girls, they were these were all interesting people. Whether they were into poetry or a lot of them were into history. Um, and I think that gets lost a lot of the time in in the in the imaging of things like punk is that people forget how how artistic the people in it were. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I think somebody more intelligent than I am would probably say, well, that's a stereotype too, because I remember in LA when we called it the Orange County scene kind of took over and it was more TSOL. Uh, we used to think about them as, as aggressive beach uh, punkers from Orange County and it seemed a lot more mindless to us. And, and that was where you were more likely to get into a, to a fight or something with those guys who were looking for trouble, mm. you know, the old skinhead army from orange County oh, yeah. or something like it's very different than the Hollywood scene and the, and the places where we were hanging out. Um, you know, when you talk about the dead Kennedys, though, that's a perfect example. That is not stupid, mindless stuff. No. You know, uh, I interviewed when I got into radio. I mean, one of the, one of the great perks was you could call people up and say, love to interview you on the radio show. And you find yourself calling up, you know, people you admired. I had Jello on the show, um, and, and and which is great. Those of you who don't know Jello Biafra, he's the lead singer of the Dead Kennedys, and he's very anti-corporate. And I, I, I woke him up because I remember calling um, his label, Alternative Tentacles, and saying, yeah, well, I want to have Jello on the show. And they said, well, what time is your show on? And I think it was, I forgot what it was on at that hour, but but it was noon or one or something. They go, that's going to be a real problem because Jello doesn't get up till three. And then we got him on the phone somehow, and he's on the program and everything. You know, you can almost hear the suspicion in his voice because I'm on AM radio you know he doesn't know me from adam and we go to a break and you know you can hear the commercials when you're on hold on the phone and we come back from the break and jello launches into this visceral <laughs> critique of the advertisers that just played right and i remember thinking to myself as the program director walked in the room giving me you know screaming and giving me the, the cut signal i remember thinking to myself well what did you expect right you know <laughs> you, you want a jello be opera on the show you got jello be opera on the show right and i i basically agreed with him and i uh, had a conversation with the program director afterwards and that's why i never get along with program directors that's why i do a podcast now right right no i i i mean and that's what like w- knowing that you had a past within the the context of this music that's why it's like you know i i took the one-to-one analogy of you know whatever a punk band releasing a seven inch single and a person doing a podcast like i mean it's it's apples to apples it's it is apples that's a great it is apples to apples yes and and so yeah i I, we'll hit that point a little bit later but i wanted to so were you like you said in the early 80s like you were uh you know were you going to shows like did you have a a desire to actually like get up there and play in a band no no but i was going to show we were definitely going to shows and it just depended on where you were going to go because for example you know when you're a kid you got to be careful at some of these venues and that was the thing is you know we used to talk about first wave punk second wave punk all this stuff used to mean something Something when we were younger um first wave was 77 everybody always said we were 79 80 so second wave punk is how we'd call it or second wave new wave or second wave new music i mean you know pick your pick your label Mm -hmm. and there were clubs like the starwood for example um like laurel canyon and uh and and like highland or something and and, or or was it uh santa monica and, and laurel and you go down there and the starwood was rough right um, you, you know, we used to see girls. You go, I been, went to the Starwood like twice and watched these girls who came in with hair that was considered too long by the locals at the Starwood. And there were girls who would run around with these like the scissors your teacher used to have in elementary school, those giant scissors, and would just walk up behind these girls with long hair and cut it. <laughs> And, and and it was right. The parking lot was rough. Right. And I was I, and I was like 14 years old. And I remember thinking, this is just not safe for a 14 year old. It wasn't. And, and at the time, you know, people forget this. It was not always welcoming. Uh, being a punk was a little like being a surfer, which was fine if you're on your beach. But if you're on their beach, you know, then it's locals only. And then it's not so fun. And, and you know, the, the big thing that used to upset me about the whole punk movement was you could see it was going to die out because everybody was accusing everyone else of being a poser <laughs> or, you know, you're not – you weren't into it early enough or you're not – and you think to yourself, okay, this is welcoming, right? right. We're, we're, taking, we're taking it and, 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 and sectioning ourselves off ever smaller. And then it was like, oh, you're a Hollywood punk going down and viewing a show in Orange County. Get the hell out of here. Okay, well, that's going to be great for the Orange County bands, right? right? right. Um, so it was it was not 
always a welcoming movement. And so like going down to some of these clubs where you weren't known wasn't always safe. Now, when I was 17, 18, it became a lot easier. But when I was 17 and 18, that movement was starting to die. Right. But we would go to clubs in the valley, um, which was closer to home and more our our part of town. And, and, and yeah, that was easier. And you'd see some bands. I mean, again, when you try to tell people what some of these bands were like, I mean, there are bands that were comic bands. They were they were almost novelty bands. There was one in Southern Cal called the Surf Punks. And, you know, if you listen to one of their albums, and they didn't have a lot of them, but if you listen to one of them now, they sound like a joke. But if you actually saw them in concert, they were hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Just hilarious. And they put three or four of these bands together, and you go to some place like the Country Club in the Valley, and you'd see three or four of these bands together, and it was a fantastic night. And you could be underage. And this is how long ago it was. They didn't have MTV yet. And so between bands, they would put down like a movie screen you would have in a movie theater and they would play music videos, which no one had ever seen before. Right. And there obviously were not a ton of them. And some of them were like, you know, you go back and see David Bowie's stuff from the middle 70s where he was doing these weird film projects that weren't music videos then. But that's what you threw up there because that's what you had. And I just remember some fantastic nights when I was about 14 years old at these clubs. And you felt totally safe in that environment. Going down to the Starwood, though, that could be a little rougher. Right, right. <laughs> no. So and, and what appealed to you about the because the, the, the common notion is that, you know, when you start to get attracted to, quote unquote, outsider art, you know, your parents especially would be like, whoa like you know once you started to go to these shows and started to come home and bring records into the house like were your parents like dan what road are you going down my friend like this is scary let's let's talk about this my parents were artists and so in in one sense they were cool with it i mean they were kind of beatniks in their own day mm -hmm. um so they, they were kind of cool with that part the rougher part was and again doesn't sound like anything now but but go dye your hair or go bleach your hair. And and I mean, I had two stepbrothers. I still have two stepbrothers. And oh my God, they would have been listening to Foreigner, see? And they hassled me mercilessly about my fashion choices and my my uh, my hair choices. And uh, I don't have much hair left now, but I used it a lot when I had it. And, 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 what was your, uh, what was your and, color of choice? I said I had every color you might see naturally. Okay. I didn't there was no, no greens. Okay. Not not on purpose anyway. Right. You know, I'd go in the pool too many times <laughs> with that bleached hair of mine and sometimes it would inadvertently be but but every, I mean I had I had once I remember I had you know what Superman's hair looks like in the comics where it's black but there's that tiny bit of blue almost if the light catches it right. Yep. I had that once. Oh. Um I used to bleach and then you'd bleach on top of bleach. I mean there was a time period where like I was wearing every Everything I was wearing was bleached. My hair was bleached. And then you'd bleach it again after it was partly grown out. And you'd have this, I don't even know how to describe the look I had going. And then it would oxidize at the beach because, you know, a Southern California guy. And so I had like, I don't even know what you describe it, nine, ten different shades of blonde and black mixed into my hair. Um, so, so, yeah, I took some hassling over that. I do remember my dad, though. My dad lived on this windy hill in the hills of Southern Cal. And you'd have to um, – over by Mulholland. And you'd have to to follow this windy, like old Italian country uh, uh, path down from his house to get to the bottom of the hill. And we would have these parties at my place. I lived below him. I had an apartment. And these guys would, would saunter out of there at like 7 in the morning. We're all dressed the way we were the night before. My dad was on the balcony looking down, and there's this motley crew of people in leather jackets and black jeans, and and you know, I mean, just bedraggled and you know, looking like they hadn't slept. You know, marching down the hill like some punk army. And he looked at me, he goes, "Nice bunch of friends you have there, kid." So I mean, that's that's you know, that's that's kind of how it was. But but everybody was pretty good humored about it, and and we were always smart people. And I mean, I, you know, my, my dad knew what he was dealing with. Yeah, I know. Well, it sounds, it sounds like too the, you know, like you were talking about this sort of notion of, you know, punk and the aesthetic of punk at that time in particular was so apathetic, you know, anti-authoritarian. Um, but the, the, the apathy was what bled through everything. And so, 
you, it was painted with such a broad brush of people being, like you said, unintelligent, uninspired, just like, well, you know, government sucks, but we can't do anything about it. So fuck that. But that wasn't always the case. And it sounds like that part of the culture did not appeal to you. It was more of the, uh, you know, the the independent spirit and like how creative people were within that that scene. Yeah, it was it was not it was not um, the problem with 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 like um, a punk ethos and then trying to build a movement is all of us were anti group. So how, so how do you do that? You know, I right. mean, we're all we were all and I still am just individualists. And and yet what you're talking about is is creating, you know, we, people would tell you it was doomed from the start because we were so individualistic. And we did, you know, what's that old Groucho Marx line? He didn't want to be a member of any club that would have him yep. as a member. Right. That's kind of how we all felt. And 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 the minute you started trying to look like you were a part of some group was the minute you you sold out kind of, you know, and you you bought into the to the media's idea of what this is or you decide you're going to I'm going to buy this leather jacket because it'll make me look all punk rock or something. I mean, eventually you realize that that punk never died because those people are still out there. They may look like stockbrokers now, but as long as they maintain that that attitude that they had at the time you know in other words the punk was a manifestation of the attitude um and 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 not the other way around so those punk rock is a mentality uh it's been around forever uh jerry lee lewis was punk rock uh, mm-hmm. i used to have a friend said mozart was punk rock and so i i, I think it's just a brand of people that are individualistic and, and 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 i think that a lot of other adjectives i could throw in there and i think we we see it manifested from time to time and 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 i was lucky enough to live in one of those times when when that was big and the funny part is is you didn't want it to become too big because it was your little right thing, then it wasn't right? your own right yeah but then it was going to go away i mean if it doesn't continue to build it goes away but but we look back we i mean i think people like me look back on that as a bit of a golden era and it didn't last very long the thing that i always found interesting too is like there there was always those ear markers of like okay you know like uh, like you signified you know in the early 80s obviously you know punk was a thing and then hardcore started to infiltrate and then you know the marker of like well it started that started to die out in 86 87 um and so you can always you know whenever your entry point is to that particular music that will kind of be your golden era I think the the trappings that fall into that are the people that, um, you know, like you said, kind of come at it from a really judgmental standpoint and look at those, you know, 13, 14 year old kids and are just like, well, screw those guys. They weren't born early enough. And it's like, well, well, what am I supposed to do? (laughs) I can't do anything about that. No. And you can, you know, we all go back and listen to the older music. I mean, that's the funny thing about punk rock, I guess you could say, is that is that everybody I ever knew who was into it. And, you know, again, we all started off as what, you know, we would have called them posers back then. We all started off with much lighter music. And, and, and you know, you, you don't wake up at 12 years old and, and go from, you know, whatever the have pop group we were listening to and then all uh, go into the dead Kennedys. That's that that's a transition. And so to expect people to have, oh, yeah, 12 years old, you weren't listening to the Sex Pistols. What's wrong with you? It just it didn't work that way. You go back and you listen to the early stuff and, and, and the rock and roll from the 50s. Every punk rocker I ever knew loved that rock and roll from the 50s. I mean, we all love Jerry Lee Lewis and we all love those those three minute songs and a lot of the stuff from the 60s, too. I mean, I didn't know any punks that didn't like the seeds. Mm, right? right. Or. Or, 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 and like I said, even the Stones, the, the British looked at the the Stones and all of those bands as as the old bands to be toppled. The Clash, so famous. What did he say? No, no Elvis, Beatles, or Rolling Stones in 1977. Yep. But we we didn't feel that way in the states, especially the Stones. Always seemed like the outlaw band of their era. And so I think every era has had that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so for me, you could meet people in the forties and sit down with them and find a punk sensibility about them. They wouldn't have called it that, but I think those people have always been around. You, you see it, especially in literature. I mean, there's lots of people over the eras who are punk writers from the last hundred years. Right. No, the label is applicable. Like you said, that's, uh, it can span time and distance, but it just may not be called that in that particular juncture. Um, the uh and, and so do you think nirvana would you call nirvana punk yeah i mean honestly yeah just because they i, I would feel more comfortable calling them you know i mean again kind of going back to that sort of labels labels labels. I know. Right. going back to that sort of independent music i think that it's like yes because they you know they played shows in front of 20 people they put out their own records like those are bands 
like regardless of the sonics of whatever those bands are, are doing, I kind of put all those bands together. Like you were saying, that sort of, you know, you that that bin in the corner of Tower Records, all those bands, that's what they were doing because they didn't have, you know, anybody supporting them. It was just like, well, I guess we'll put this together ourselves because we have no clue who to talk to. <laughs> I, see, I'm, I don't go with you on that because okay. I saw I saw a lot of bands. Do I mean people? You know, when when the punk stuff started dying, we got the hair band era, and, and in in L A. especially L A. big hair band right. town, and and I knew a lot of guys who were in these bands, and and the way these clubs worked is that they would give you a certain amount of tickets if you were you know Gazaris or or uh, the whiskey. Right. And these bands had to go and then sell their tickets. And so you'd be on like Sunset Boulevard yeah, and, yeah. and the actual band members would be saying, come to our show. I mean, it was very grassroots, but it wasn't punk. No, no, um, true, true. Yeah. For me, when I heard Nirvana, I mean, we, we've been going through years of, of trying to find, I mean, listen, I, there are people who will say to me, Dan, you're an idiot because there was Husker Du and there were all these bands under the radar that you're not talking about in 87, 88. And it's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, but but it was dominated by all these hair bands. And then you'd get like a Guns N' Roses and you'd have to say to yourself, is that close enough to what I like sure. to make it for me? And then when I was, you know, probably early, I don't know, 90, 91, 92, mm-hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm mid twenties and Nirvana comes around and we were like, yes, I know this music again. Right. Right. And, 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 you know, without any, and they were calling it grunge, but I was listening to it going, no, this, this reminds me of stuff that I like. And this is a sensibility. And it, there was something about the way Cobain screamed. Mm-hmm. Um, that I didn't like a lot of the other Seattle music because to me that wasn't the same. But Nirvana, I listened to and I go, okay, this is not just music I like, but these are people who listened to the same music that I like. Sure. And and you could tell when you heard them. And and you know, I don't know if bands like The Offspring named themselves because they were supposed to be another, you know, sort of like the next, the children of of the punks or whatever. But when I heard The Offspring the first time, I remember thinking, okay. This is punk rock music, even if the punks would go, no, this is corporate, blah, blah, blah. Right. They, you know, you, you could sort of tell, and especially from a Southern Californian, that sounded like, you know, Southern California always mixed punk rock with surfing kind of sounds. Totally. Um, they didn't get that in New York, that the New York music and the, and the British punk, none of the, that had that. So the offspring to me sounded like some of that Orange County punk that we used to listen to. And, and Nirvana just sounded like, I mean, they put their own twist on it, but if they'd have come around in 77 or 78, I don't think they would have looked out of place in some circles. No, no, I I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, And so then as you, you know, as you, it's been well documented that obviously you've, you you came up in terrestrial radio and that was kind of, you know, your career path from that perspective. Um, Was it one of those things that as, you know, because you had this foundation of sort of, you know, DIY ethics, like, you know, I... I know, like the, like you're saying, the sort of individual nature that, uh, you know, punk breeds, um, did you feel, you know, out of place? Like you said, in most of these, uh, I'm constantly battling with program directors. This is not, uh, this is not the place for me ultimately. Well, it was worse than that. Cause I started off in television news before I got into radio Okay, and, and, and television news was, was interesting when I was doing it behind the scenes and then I, I became a reporter in front of the camera, and it was the most frustrating experience in the world um, for exactly a lot of the reasons you mentioned. I, I just I couldn't I couldn't fit into this box that that I, I, I'll tell you a story. This and, and I don't think I've ever told this one before, but it's the moment I absolutely knew I didn't belong in television news. Um, I had just gotten a promotion on the news staff, and I was going to be a bigger member now of the way they marketed the news. And so they shot this promo where you have to. Face, you have to start with your side to the cameraman, and then you have to turn and smile and maybe put your hand in your pocket. And that's going to be part of you know the commercials and stuff, right? Your trusted news team or whatever it was going to be. Right. And most of these guys and, and, and anchorettes, as we used to call them, could pull this off in three or four takes, and they're out of there. I was about 70 takes into it before <laughs> the cameraman said, is this going to work? And I said, there's no way in hell this is going to work. Right. And, 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 you know, I just... I knew right then that this whole thing was too cosmetic and too fake and, 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 and I didn't feel it and I couldn't live it and I couldn't – and I would leave the station at night and just look up in the sky and pull my hair out and go, what the hell am I doing? Mm-hmm. You know. 
And so when the offer to do radio came along, and basically they said, we're going to give you three hours a day, five days a week, your show, you talk about what you want to talk about. I thought, okay, this is the creative freedom I need, right? This is what, I mean, I can't blossom without that. Right. And then it's, you know, 365 days of arguing with program directors every day. And I was, fa- I must have been okay at my job because I should have been fired 50 times for being unreasonable and hard to get along with and inflexible. And um, I mean, I was never like a prima donna, but I just wouldn't do things. I mean, I had a big fight over like, you know, you're going to talk about the OJ Simpson trial. Right. No, I'm not. And it was just day in and day out. And then one day it was like, you're going to go in there right now and you're going to talk about that trial or you're going to be fired. And I walked into the studio and I turned on the mic and I said, the media is making too big of a deal out of the O.J. Simpson trial. Don't you think so, people? And that was the topic. And, oh, my God, it was a knockdown drag out right after that. So, right. um, so for me, podcasting is so punk, you know, and so do it yourself that, that it's the first time I've ever really flourished and felt like I could I could make – if you'll pardon, it sounds grandiose to say so, any kind of art, yeah. anything, anything. And it's the only thing I've ever done in my life in terms of a career where you look back at the work and you say, okay, I'm relatively proud of that. Um, I, I'm a stickler, so I'm not really proud of anything, but I really hated some of my past work. And I can look at podcasting and say, well, if it sucks, if my work sucks, at least it sucks because of me. And that's what I wanted to do. Right. And I did it my way. So if, if it sucks, at least it's my work. Right. You know? It's on it's on your back. This this yeah, this It's my trash. Right. This yeah, this this pile you've built. <laughs> that horrible song I recorded was my horrible song. Right. So did as you were uh, you know, matriculating through the uh, the punk scene, was there anything that you contributed from like were you interested in sort of the behind the scenes stuff? Like did you ever try to like book shows or do a zine or anything like that? like that from a creative standpoint the music for me was a muse for me to do other things it wasn't i i never wanted to be in a band i never wanted to be in the music industry or anything I never, I didn't have the music industry at all yeah um that didn't appeal to me for for me punk wasn't just a music thing as i said i was reading uh i mean you know you, you pick up someone like hunter s thompson is that punk rock mm-hmm. you know uh but boy i got into him heavily um we would go when I was in college at the University of Colorado. We would go see bands, and this was after after punk was over. But you, but you would they would be post punk, I guess you could say, and we would enjoy the little bits that came out of that. And so so I, 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 getting into the music scene was never what I wanted to do. I wish the music scene had stayed more the way I wanted. I mean, if you if you look at my music collection right now, which my children are forbidden from doing, <laughs> and my wife warns other people not to do, right. Um, but it it all looks like old fashioned, um, you know, stuff. And, and when I hear it, it still makes me feel creative. And 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 I mean, I've never really grown. <laughs> I've never. I mean, all I ever wanted was that music. I didn't want to make it. I didn't want to move on from it. Um, and it still inspires me to go in there and try to do something different. I mean, even the Dead Kennedys. My only complaint about the Dead Kennedys is the same complaint I had about the Sex Pistols. Why couldn't we get one more good album from them? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, you're like, why can't I have like one more piece of material from them in order to? Yeah, I mean, and, and quality work. I mean, don't get me wrong, but but the Dead Kennedys' later work was not equal to their early no. work. And the Pistols, oh my God, could we have just had one good album besides the one we got? Basically, so yeah, my the complaint for me is that I I would love to be able to go back and open up some time travel treasure chest and find all this recorded material that we didn't know existed. And be able to have a whole bunch of new songs from all those same people. I listen to the same songs I've heard hundreds of times. Right, right, right. Now, well, it's it's cool because I like to hear your path on the fact that you described it perfectly in the sense of the music was was amused because usually kids get bit by the bug of like, oh, dude, I got to play in a band, and then they have that focus that solely drives them. And then, you know, sometimes that leads them down a path of making horrible decision after horrible decision. Um, you know, not to say that y- you probably feel like you made some horrible decisions on a career choice, like you were mentioning earlier, but the, you know, the music industry kind of seeps into people when realistically that's such a small portion of people that can actually fit through that keyhole, you know? You know, that's how, I think that's how anything though, that is an attract. I mean, you know, news, uh, radio, any of those things. I mean, those are all professions where there are too many applicants for positions. And I think that's acting is that way. I think most artistic things where you can actually make a living have more, you know, uh, more supplicants than, than, uh, 
than 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 positions and, and um and, and so I, that doesn't bother me because i think people need to do that i think you need to reach out especially when you're young yeah and take a chance i mean we don't know what you're capable of right i mean i think that's part of the punk ethos too it's go for it totally let's see and and and, and if you could become a heroin addict and go down that road <laughs> well i mean it's, it's a known danger isn't it yep. um so so but but no i would never counsel people to to be careful in that regard i think you've got to go and try to maximize, you know, what's it say? It's, it's not the it's not the the cards you're dealt, but how you play them. Right. I think everybody needs to needs to be aggressive in the way they play the cards they've been dealt. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely. I mean, there's a time and a place to be, you know, uh, brash and irresponsible, and like, you know, a perfect time to play in a band is when you're, you know, 15 to 23 years old, when you can live with your parents and you don't have to worry about overhead, and you can. Well, and, and if you're working hard, is that really irresponsible? I mean, to, sure. to me, I, if you're ambitious, and and I I think I'm one of those people. That thinks ambition might be a gene. Mm. They might figure that out someday, but wrapped up in your DNA. But I mean, if you're working hard, you ought to be working hard at something you'd like to do. It doesn't mean you're going to get it, but why would you work hard at something you don't want to do? Right? right? You, you might, if, if you're going to work your rear end off, it might as well be in pursuit of something you really want. And the truth is, when you look at all these people that have those positions that you got, God, I'd really love to have what that person has. Most of them have worked really hard to get there or really hard to stay there. So I, I don't, you know, I don't consider it irresponsible if you decide I want to go in the music business. I'm going to work my ass off to be successful. The odds are still against you, but if people didn't try, there wouldn't be anybody in the music business, you know. So, yeah. so more power to them, right? Live your dream if you can while you can. Yeah, no, totally. Um, the last thing I want to hit on before I let you go was the, um, you know, like we were alluding to earlier, the apples to apples correlation of of podcasting and you know putting out your own stuff. Um, so do you know the 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 DNA that is obviously in your show is is completely you know built from the ground up um and so i presume you're kind of reminded daily of the the ethics that you have learned from obviously all the records that that you consumed um when you were when you were that age i'm still listening to it every day i mean you know you want to get into sometimes to get up for you know i i'm a noted caffeine addict everybody knows that about me and so so before getting the programs and before i go in the studio Oh, I'm drinking another triple espresso. Sure. I'm li- I'm listening to to something that moves really fast um music wise and sometimes by the time you put the espresso down and you you turn the music off you're in the right frame of mind to be creative. Uh, and, and so I, I still use that as a kind of a muse and I I absolutely use it as a reminder that this is independent stuff that we do. And you're right. We are like an independent record label, as are you, by the way. Sure. Um, and, and, and when I talk about podcasting to people, they say that I'm an evangelist about it. But as somebody who's had to work under that corporate umbrella, and, and I'm not saying you know it'll never happen again, but once you've tasted this kind of freedom – um, if you're an independent person as you are and I am with independent ideas and, 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 and an outlook like that, this is a dream come true. People always think podcasters want to do this and then get some other gig and I keep trying to explain to them – this is the other game. <laughs> yeah. This is this is what this is what people like us work for years to do. And the radio industry was always famous that the famous Paul Harvey was a you know huge radio guy, and he had gotten to such a point in his career where they put a studio in his home, and he could do his morning routine in his pajamas with his cup of coffee. And every radio guy I ever knew said, "Oh my God, I'd love to get to the point where I could do that someday." Well, welcome to podcasting. Right. right? right. Here, here we are. And so I always tell people, keep keep giving me a buck of show so I can keep doing this the rest of my life. This is a this is an independent person's dream come true. Right, right, yeah. It's just it, it ticks off all the boxes that you need for the quote unquote dream job. Um, so, yes, it does. So, if you can make a living at it, it does. Right, for sure. Just out of my own curiosity, like what are your, what are your go to records? Like what are the ones that obviously still resonate with you from the, you know that that time period that you say you know you put on before you obviously start to dig into your you know research or shows. Oh, you're making me open up my music thing right here. Oh, it, it, it's a, it, <laughs> and it's completely fine. I knew anytime you're put on the spot, I always know that those are difficult questions. But uh... I, I, here's the thing: I go through these periods, right? So for a while, uh, a while ago, it was a it was a return to like the Keith Morris stuff. Okay, whether it's with Black Flag or I mean, Keith Morris is the only Black Flag lead singer I ever liked anyway. Okay, um, and and all of a sudden, you know, all this Circle Jerk stuff is getting downloaded off <laughs> of iTunes, and, and then and then for like five weeks, it's insane listening to nothing else, and then we move on to. 
um, the dead boys, maybe, okay. or, uh, uh, it, there's always Iggy mm-hmm. to be, uh, to be listened to or the Stooges, the Stooges. I used to have some great Stooges t-shirts back in the day. Now, and I keep thinking about the probably 137 <laughs> pound guy that was wearing those Stooges t-shirts. Right. As I look back on that from about 170, 175 pounds, I'm thinking my daughter could wear those, those, right. We, we were pretty skinny back in the punk days. As I think about it now, totally. Um, I, lo- I love me some MC five. That's a punk band to me. Definitely. Uh, Lou Reed is punk to me. The New York Dolls I still listen to. Um, uh, the, I, I swear to God, the Stones are, are a punk band if you catch them during the right era. Sure. Uh, the Sex Pistols. Um, I'm looking down at my list right now. No, that's fine. The, weird, the Weirdos, all these L.A. bands. You know, you have the Screamers, the Weirdos, right. all of those. And, you know, the, we used to say the L.A., the punk house band for L.A. was always X. Mm-hmm. And all of us saw X many, many times. And I still think the first few albums from X are wonderful. Um, so I put on any of those depending on the mood that I'm in. Even though you're obviously your, your personality definitely could match up with the high octane music that is created within, um, you know, the the historical uh context for people that are into history is definitely like you know buttoned up stuffy like and that's uh, of course that's an overgeneralization so it's like it's it's great to hear you being like yeah just put on a little circle jerks and then we'll uh we'll dive into genghis khan okay uh, well and the truth is like i said i mean i think we all started off too as we were li- i mean there's a lot of new wave stuff we used to listen to and i'll still go back i mean you go listen to devo's first album yeah. there's nothing wrong with that nope. man i'll tell you not at all um and- or or Bauhaus. You go listen to some Bauhaus or some Susie and the Banshees. There's some great Susie and the Banshees stuff. Oh, definitely. Um, but again, that that's my era. So I mean, I, I I tell people that's a great Susie and the Banshees song, and they go, "Who?" So <laughs> I'm an old guy now. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like early Joy Division. That's all they were. They're a punk band. That they weren't. They yeah. they weren't doing yeah, a anything lot of else. Listen, Adam and the Ants. Yeah. If you catch him early enough, had some great stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's funny that you, uh, you know, your uh, y- your daughters, are, you completely banished them from from your record collection, and you were like, you know, yes, do- they're totally and they're totally banned from it. Yeah, <laughs> they can't go near it. <laughs> and is that is that primarily to protect them from the sonics of it, or like, oh, I don't know if I want to go them to go down this road. You know what's funny is that is that you can. You can both be so happy with your own past and romanticize it. Let's not forget we're probably romanticizing it too. Sure. And yet, and yet, not want your your family to go down that path. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, it's, I, it totally I, makes sense. I wouldn't want my daughters to be the way I was. Right. Is, that, is that it's the typical hypocritical parent, right? Do as I say, I'm not as I did. Right? <laughs> yeah, or you know, so so no. Well, and and I think this is why, right? And I think we all understand this. And you alluded to it when you talked about music a little while ago. We lived an edgier kind of existence, and and there are people that didn't do well out of that. Some, you know, it, it's it's a pass or fail kind of test, and I and, and we all knew, I think, a lot of people who didn't pass. And while it's a wonderful experience to have gone through those things and talking about it with you now, you don't want your kid to be one of those people that don't pass those tests, Definitely. you know. Um, and, and, and again, hypocritical because you'd love them to get all the good things out of it too. I'm just, I love them too much to risk them, but I care about myself a hell of a lot less. I was happy. I'm happy to go do it with myself, but, but don't put my kids in that situation. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? And, and you know, isn't it weird for a guy whose parents were, you know, halfway cool with him doing it, but I won't, I'm not. Right, right. You're like, well, I, that it, it is funny. Cause you're like. Yeah, my parents are cool with that, but man, I sure as hell am not doing that for them. My wife, my wife, much more straight than I am. She, she would definitely not be cool with it either. But thank, thank goodness for that, right? We needed some stabilizing force in this parenting thing. I got going <laughs> right. There's a, so, there's a yin and you know? there's a yin and a yang to it. Yeah, somebody's got a bad. There's a lot of things I bring to the table that need to be balanced out. Believe me. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That, that I think that's why we're all here for you, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? You know, the funny thing about it is, Ray, is that when I was doing radio, um, I was, you know, you you have to be put in this box. And we had this whole, you know, talk radio, most people know is a right wing uh, uh, type of thing. And all these talk radio hosts are all these conservative people. And they they would put me in the middle of this. Right. So I'd have these conservative talk radio hosts before me, conservative talk radio hosts after me. And then this weird dude in the middle of the day who was not like any of them. And I used to have people, weirdos like me, who would tune in just for my little part of the day. And I would always 
have these few cult followers uh -huh. who said, thank God you're out there because no one thinks like we do. But then when you go onto the internet, whatever tiny percentage of people were those people, that's still a huge chunk of the pie when you've got 3 billion people out on the internet or whatever. So those are my listeners. And I like to think that those people are all punks. Right. <laughs> they're all like one way or another. They're all like us, either, either in mind, spirit, or actual content that they listen to on their headphones. Right, right. No, it's great. Yeah, you're just like, you're, you're picking up the, uh, you know, what's considered a disposable audience. <laughs> Either through me or, or they'll self destruct themselves. Maybe I mean, we're all we're, we're all a little bit close to the to the flame, moths to the flame. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Well, I I really really appreciate you hanging out and obviously talking about stuff that you you uh, don't typically uh, talk about in interviews. So I appreciate you uh, elaborating as you did. Well, nobody likes to hear this stuff, Ray. That's what makes me think you must be a little weird because when I bring this stuff up at parties, people shut me down fast. So <laughs> I, I'm glad you wanted to hear all these old stories. <laughs> well, I'm glad because yeah, like I said, it's just it's always it's to me it's about peeling away the layers of showing how successful you can be in whatever field you decide to choose and like you're a prime example of that just being like oh hey like you know navigating these waters still not losing your voice within you know large structures and being you know like you like you were joking about forced to kind of fit a role and it's like yeah sometimes you got to take a gig because it's not what you want to do but as long as you don't lose like you said that sort of passion and fire for everything that you cared about then that that's what will guide you you know it gets back to that line we said about posers versus the real thing you got to be true to yourself and 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 i think that's when you're unhappy like i was unhappy in 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 television reporting because it was very difficult to be true to myself when i did that and that's what makes podcasting so liberating is is now if if, if i'm not true to myself there's only one person to blame for that and so, you know, I think all of the people out there that are individuals and that bring some uniqueness to the table and that foster that. See, I, I think that's something you you can create yourself in, a, in an even more unique way if you consider that a positive thing and you nurture it. You're going to be, especially in this 21st century world, I think a more valuable I hate to say product because that kind of goes against the grain, but but I know a lot of people call me when they're young and say, what should I do for a living? Carve something out if you can, and that's easier to do if you're unique. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're on the radio, carve out your own voice in your own space, whether you're an engineer or an artist or whatever else. And so when you talk about the punk ethos, and we talked about some of the downside earlier, but some of the upside is that you were told it was okay to be different. It was celebrated. And I think that when people grew up and went out into the real world, there's a lot of button-down, uh, tie-wearing, very conservative-looking people that you would all be shocked if you could see what they looked like 30 years ago who are still carving out that little independent place for themselves as they were molding their personality during an era where Jello Biafra was helping to influence the way they thought. Yeah, no, totally. It's and you, you don't you're not asking permission to do your stuff. No, I wonder if Jello knows that. You know, I'd like to have him say ask him if he understands. How many people – I mean I got interested – I think I would have gotten interested into politics anyway. Mm -hmm. But when I'm 13 years old, Jello Biafra has got me thinking about Central America <laughs> and U.S. involved. And, and the question is, is how many 13-year-olds would have thought of that if the music they were listening to wasn't bringing it up to them in a way that appealed to them? I mean oh. my whole – I think my whole life path changed because of that. And I wonder if people like Jello are aware of that. Oh, totally. I mean it, it is so strange. Like I mean I, I myself, like I – I mean, I personally am like straight edge, which is, you know, I don't consume alcohol. I do. I know. I, know yeah, I, I figured <laughs> I was there when it started. Exactly, baby. Yeah. I remember straight edge. And, and so, <laughs> and so yeah, it is one of those things where it's just like the, you know, being directly influenced by the music. It, it's like that, that was so foundational. And yeah, you always wonder where it's like, how, how does that sit on one person being like, Hey, like, so you kind of did a lot. Uh, you, you did a lot of damage and or good to so many people because of this, you know, and I think a lot of people dream about that uh, to be influential, to have a positive impact. Right. I mean, uh, it's like we talked about earlier, how great to make a living doing something where you can do something you love and, and, and encourage and foster that kind of feeling in other people. I mean, maybe I'm just biased towards this kind of job we do, but God, that's and and to make a living doing it, mm -hmm. that to me is the perfect kind of conditions. That that's you can die happy if you create a life like that. Yeah, for sure, because that's that's the the legacy that's ultimately left. Where it's like it's not it doesn't matter necessarily what you do, but it's the foundation that you've built upon or that you've built that hopefully other people can build on moving forward. 
And I'm biased, dude, but I don't think Foreigner was going to get me there. Just, you know, between you and me, no. I don't think uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think Ted Nugent was going to get me there. I don't think Peter Frampton was going to get me there. They didn't really have much uh, uh, a foundational aspect to their music besides uh, rocking out. Listen, they said about Peter Frampton's album at the time that it sold more than if Frampton Comes Alive more than any other album at the time. And I remember thinking at the time, that's reason enough to not buy it. You know, if that many people like it, it can't be that good. Totally. Contrarian by nature, Dan Carlin. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll let you go because I don't want to take up more of your, your valuable and precious time. But thank you so much for uh, going down memory lane and, and showing how the, uh, the hardcore history and common sense is obviously it's, it's, a, it's a punk rock podcast. You know, you just don't talk about music. <laughs> Listen, man, I hope it was halfway decent. I appreciate you having me on. No, no, for sure. So that was Dan Carlin. Like I said, check out his podcast, please. You will absolutely adore it. It will blow your mind in so many different ways. And honestly, you'll become more educated. Both of his podcasts, both Hardcore History and Common Sense. They're both irregular posting. He doesn't post a new episode a week or anything, only when he feels inspired. So, uh, But subscribe to both of those and you will never miss that awesome stuff coming your way. And thank you again to both Brittany, his assistant, and Dan for taking the time to do this because, yeah, I just, I I didn't think this would happen and I am so glad that it did. So anyways, 100wordspodcast.com, propertyofzack.com. The guest next week is Koji, Andrew. Koji is a acoustic artist in the independent music scene and I, I it was such an in-depth conversation. I can't wait to share that one with you. And uh, Tom Richfield, as always, is the producer, creative genius behind a lot of this awesome stuff. So until next week, please be safe, everybody. Everybody.